Hello, and welcome to Prairie Pulse. Today, we have a great opportunity. I'm in Washington, D.C., in the office of Senator John Hoven, the senator from the great state of North Dakota. Senator Hoven, thanks so much for having us here today. John, good to have you here. Well, we're proud to be here. As we get started, uh, Senator, and you know, tell the folks uh, you know, about where you're from originally and then a little bit of, about yourself. Well, of course, I worked as governor uh, in North Dakota for 10 years, so I you know, know the people and the state very, very well from that experience, and it, it was an incredible honor for me and for my wife, Mikey, and uh, we appreciate it so much. Uh, and of course, now it's a tremendous honor to serve in the U.S. Senate. I was originally born in Bismarck. Um, we moved around some. We, I lived down in Ashley, down in kind of uh, southeast central North Dakota. My gran grandfather had a ranch down there. And then we moved up just northwest of Minot. And that's pretty much where I grew up is in that Minot area. So moved around a little bit. North Dakota is home. And uh, it's still home. Our, our, our home is Bismarck. And you know I have a house there. We have an apartment out here. Yes, sir. Well, let's talk some about the election that just finished. Can, can you talk about your reaction to what happened in North Dakota with the results? Well, I, you know, I actually thought that Governor Romney was going to become president. And so um, I knew it would be a close race, but I actually thought he, that he would win. Uh, he didn't. And so President Obama continues. And, and I think there's a real onus now to work in a bipartisan way not just in the Senate and the House and Congress, but with the administration, find ways to, to put solutions in place for the people of this great country. In North Dakota, close race between, uh, obviously between Rickberg and, and Heidi Heitkamp. We knew it was gonna be a close race, it was. And, uh, and Heidi won, and I've worked with her for years, look forward to working with her on behalf of the people of, of certainly our country, but, but obviously on behalf of the people of North Dakota to, to do the best possible job that we can. The other races, you know, the Republicans did tremendously. Uh, governor's race, Governor Dalrymple, somebody who's been my partner for 10 years, you know, when I was governor, uh, obviously my lieutenant governor, somebody that I think is very capable, does a great job, and, and is doing a great job as governor for the state. But, but across the board, whether you look at the statewide offices, the legislature, um, you know, but throughout, the, the Republican Party did really well, and I, and I think it goes back to doing a good job for the, the people of our state. I, I look at a, an election, any election really, as a job interview. That's how I see them. And I think that the, uh, the Republicans are doing a good job in North Dakota of moving our state forward, and it, it shows. People all over the country are talking about North Dakota, and that's great. Yeah. Well, I know you've had a chance to, to meet, uh, at least uh, with uh, Sen future Senator Heidkamp. I believe she was in town recently. Mm -hmm. But can you talk a little more about your relationship with future Representative Kramer and Senator Heidkamp? I have good relationships with both of them. I actually initially appointed Kevin to the PSC, mm -hmm. uh, his, his first term on the PSC. And then after that, he won and won uh, election to the Public Service Commission. So we have a very good relationship, and we have had for uh, many years. But the same is true with Heidi. She and I have worked together uh, all the way back to Bank of North Dakota days. So we have a, a, you know, a long relationship. I think we work well together. I think even if you, if you look at her campaign, you see any number of areas where she talked about issues that we're going to be able to work on together very well. So I look forward to working with her. I not only, I mean, I called her and congratulated her the day, the day after the election. And we've met in person at least twice and, and already made arrangements to meet again. Because, look, this is about getting the job done for the, the people that elect you. Okay. Well, let's talk now about what's going on here in D.C. The fiscal cliff. Everybody's hearing about it. There's a lot of talk about it with the automatic spending cuts coming up and tax increases slated to go through January 1st or 2nd, whichever that date is. Uh, can you talk about what's going on with that and what, 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 how you're dealing with that? Uh, Tomorrow, Friday, uh, the leadership of the House and the Senate will be meeting with President Obama, and myself and others are doing everything we can, uh, everything we can to push to get uh, the framework for an agreement. We need uh, agreement on a big deal that includes tax reform, entitlement reform, better spending control, uh, you know, an entire plan that will help us get on top of the debt and the deficit, make sure that our Entitlement programs are solvent both now and for the future and provide that certainty that stimulates the private sector, that gets that private sector investment going. That's what will really create the jobs. 
And that not only is important to get people back to work, but as you get that economy growing, that's what really generates your revenue to, uh, to take care of the deficit and the debt. Okay. Well, Senator, uh, a lot of talk uh, throughout the campaign and other issues that, you know, on the issue of tax increases on the wealthy. Mm -hmm. President Obama campaigned on that and, of course, has, has been talking about that. So he, maybe he has a mandate now to kind of move forward with that. But to some degree, uh, for him, but so what are you saying? What are you saying for alternatives for that? Or You know, the options that we've put forward would be to not raise rates, rather hold the line on rates, uh, if possible, reduce them, but then close loopholes and find, you know, and the deductions and, and the various credits as a way to, to, to generate revenue. But the real revenue comes from growth. And with the kind of pro-growth tax reform I'm talking about, that's what will really engage the private sector, get that investment going, get the economy growing, and you then get revenue from growth, not from higher taxes. That is exactly what we did in North Dakota over the past decade. In fact, we've actually lowered the tax burden and we have tremendous uh, revenue growth because of that growing economy. That's what we need to do at the national level as well. So that's what we've put forward. I think it does reach out uh, to the administration because we're saying, look, close those loopholes and, and, and credits and deductions, come up with a pro-growth tax reform approach and that uh, you know, that growth, that revenue that will come with economic growth is a way to really not only get people back to work, but, but get on top of this deficit. You know, some believe that uh, some steep cuts could be made uh, in the military budget, including bases overseas. Mm -hmm. uh, what, what are your thoughts on this? Well, right now we have what's called sequestration under the Budget Control Act, which requires uh, about a tr another trillion dollars. There, there's uh, more than a trillion dollars in, in uh, reductions that have already been made, but there's another trillion that has to be made over the next 10 years, which means $100 billion this year, half of which would come out of defense. So we're in a situation where we've already had about half a trillion dollar reduction in the defense budget, and now we'd have to find another half trillion, starting with 50 billion this year. I think that's too much pressure to put on the military. So yes, we will have to make reductions, in military spending, and we will, starting with the reduction in spending that result from not being in Iraq and soon not being in Afghanistan, all right? In addition, we'll have to find other reductions to meet the uh, budget that, that I've already outlined for you. But I think sequestration puts too much of that burden on the military. That's why I think instead of doing sequestration, which is part of the fiscal cliff, we need to go through, prioritize, and make uh, discretionary reductions, which I believe we absolutely can do. So in terms of the military, yes, we're making some reductions, but I think sequestration calls for too much. However, when it comes to some overseas bases and some of those kind of things, I think those are areas where, yes, we can make more reductions. Okay. Talked about entitlements a little bit, but so can you talk more about what we really proposed making uh, adjustments there? You know, I think the approach that works is we say, look, we've got to have make sure that our entitlement programs are solvent both now and for the future. And the way you do that, I think, that gets everybody on board is we say for people that are, say, 50 or 55 years old, we're not going to change it for you. Anyone that's older than, say, 50 or 55, somewhere in there, depending on the actuarial analysis, okay, but right in that range, we say anybody that's that age or older, it's going to be the same. Don't worry. It's not going to change. Then for younger people, we say, okay, now we're going to have to make some changes on a bipartisan basis and get by. That's very important because to get everybody to buy in, it's got to be bipartisan, okay? But for younger people who say, yeah, we got to make some changes, I think younger people are going to say, yes, you do, because otherwise the program won't be there for us. So I think in that way, you get bipartisanship, so you got both sides on and you've got both the older and the younger demographic on board, I think that becomes doable, and that's why I believe we can address this fiscal cliff with the kind of tax reform I've described to you and that approach on entitlement reform. Okay. And I believe we need to. We, look, these are the big challenges that the people send us here to address. We need to do it. And, and that's, I push it every day in our caucus and anywhere else that I can get somebody to listen. Okay. Well, uh, let's, let's move to the farm bill. It was, that was a big subject during, uh, during the, the campaign trail. Uh, is there anything on the table during sort of the lame duck session here it, it, to move it forward? Absolutely. Look, 
we've got a very good product that came out of the Senate. It, it emphasizes crop insurance. It's cost effective. It provides good support for our farmers and ranchers. It saves $25 billion. I mean, we need to, to pass the bill. And so what has to happen now is we need to get the House to bring the bill that they uh, uh, voted through their Ag Committee. They need to bring it to the floor in the House and they need to move the bill. And that's the step that has to happen now. So we are doing everything we can with our House counterparts to get them to move on the bill. The version that they put together uh, in their House Ag Committee will easily m match with ours and we can have a final product in no time at all and a good product that saves anywhere from 25 to 33 billion dollars to help with the fiscal cliff, okay? But the, but the House has got to move the bill and we need to keep that push on to get them to do it. So, so then, uh, you know, the farm subsidiaries uh, are something that could be cut in the current political climate? Well, we take all direct payments out, they're gone. You know, uh, that's $50 billion right there. So we, absolutely we find savings, but in, instead then we enhance crop insurance, which is exactly what our farmers and ranchers told us to do. This bill is responsive to what the farmers and ranchers said we need to do. So we have a good safety net, but at the same time we save revenue. Now think about it. If we can accomplish the same thing across the board in all other areas of government, we not only get a product that helps our small businesses like farmers and ranchers, okay, but also helps us address the deficit and the debt. So I, I mean, I think agriculture is stepping up and doing its part in a big, big way and that's why I'm obviously a big fan of the farm bill that we've put together and feel we've got to do everything we can to get it passed. But President Obama has been reelected, uh, so is there any chance uh, that Obamacare will be repealed now? Or? You know, at this point I'd have to say it looks like it's more likely that what we'll try to do is start to, uh, I, I would say, put some of the fixes in place or some of the, you know, do some things to improve it. Um, it, it, it is very complicated. Uh, I'm concerned that it takes away individual discretion in terms of someone picking their own health care provider and their own health care insurance. Uh, elements of competition that can help reduce uh, price while increasing access. I mean, those are the things that, that we've got to work on. And so, you know, what looks like more likely at this point is, you know, how do we come together in a bipartisan way and really put some things in place that will help drive costs down, improve access, and give people more choice? And those are the things that, that you know, we really have to work on. And, you know, one of the conversations that Heidi and I had early on is I, of course, was saying, gee, I've got this energy legislation that, you know, I hope you'll help us pass because we need, you know, to be bipartisan on it. And she brought up, she has some health care ideas, that, uh, some fixes uh, or improvements for uh, health care that maybe we could work on. And so, I, you know, I'm looking forward to seeing what those are. Well, with that, let's, let's move to North Dakota, the, the oil and gas industry. I understand uh, you're working uh, on some uh, regulations with the uh, EPA, either softening or changing those regulations. Can you talk about that? Yeah, w whether it's the uh, oil patch, natural gas, whether it's coal or even renewables, things like the biofuels, one of the real challenges we have right now is this immense amount of federal regulation that is just coming out and it's confusing and it's holding up billions, hundreds of billions of dollars of investment in this country that would otherwise go into energy development. And that's not important just in terms of more energy development. That investment also drives the new technologies that provide better environmental stewardship. So what we've got, what we have to do to really unleash the private sector in energy development is to cut through that regulatory maze and have regulation that is clear, certain, and understandable. And we have to have regulators understand that their job is, of course, to protect the environment, but at the same time, to empower that investment that will drive the technology that will produce more energy with better environmental stewardship. Again, that's what we're doing in North Dakota. That's what we need to do as a country. So I have legislation, whether it's coal ash recycling, whether it's empower states, which deals with hydraulic fracturing, uh, whether I have the Domestic Energy and Jobs Act, which has a whole 13 different bills that have actually passed the House that all go to creating this environment that will help energy development in this country. And I have the Domestic Fuels Act, which actually streamlines the process to bring biofuels not only to the market, but to 
help retailers sell biofuels in addition to fossil fuels. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I know uh, Senator-elect Heidkamp talked about in her campaign getting staff on the ground uh, out in the oil country to help with the infrastructure needs and such. Uh, are there any plans to do something like this? Already have done that. John Cameron, uh, who has a tremendous amount of experience working at the local level uh, with city administration and, and county administration, uh, is somebody that I've hired to go to work in uh, Williston. He'll be based in Williston, which I think is the first time a Senate, uh, we've, we've had a Senate office out in uh, western North Dakota, west of Minot or, or Bismarck. And so he'll be working in Williston and Dickinson and, and the whole uh, 19 oil and gas producing uh, counties out there to, to really help, uh, you know, right now in North Dakota, number one priority is infrastructure. And uh, so we're, we're working in a big way to help and support the state's efforts uh, on infrastructure. I was on the conference committee for the highway bill. We did a lot of work there, uh, not only to get the highway bill approved, but also to reauthorize uh, flood insurance as well as the student loan uh, program. But we really are working to help the state with infrastructure. We're going to continue to do that. So I'm going to have somebody out there on the ground directly involved day to day helping with that infrastructure challenge. Well, then, do you think North Dakota's uh, oil industry is moving at the right speed or does it need to slow down a little? I mean, look, we got to manage our growth. Um, we've got to make sure we preserve quality of life. That's very important because I, I differentiate between the near term and the long term. And the long term is uh, that we're going to continue to have energy growth and development in both traditional and renewable energy. We are going to continue to be a leader in oil and gas production in this country. And so we have to have a good environment to do business in, but we've got to have a good environment to live in so that people continue to support that kind of development. So we have to properly work with the industry so that we manage that growth in a way that works for everybody. And I think what you're going to see now is that we are really going to catch up with this growth, not only in terms of infrastructure, but a lot of these, these oil companies have been really kind of racing to drill leases before those leases expire. And I think they're catching up with that. So now you're going to see them go to more infield drilling, which can be more of a managed pace for them. So I really, it is important that we get on top of this and we make sure that this works for the people that, that live out there and, and that their quality of life is protected uh, in a way that where they remain supportive of this, of this great um, growth and development that we have. Okay. Here's a question for you, Senator, as a Republican. Uh, there's been quite a bit of talk since the election about the Republican Party needs to reach out to, to different demographics, Latinos, women, uh, young Americans, and uh, even African Americans. Uh, what's your response? To well, that's that? right. That's true. We do need to. And again, it, I think it comes down to making sure that we're communicating and listening both ways. I think the Republican approach is one of empowerment. We say, look, the, the, the great thing about America is it's always been the best place to pursue your dreams, to, to build your business, to, to, you know, live the way you want to live and raise your family the way you want to live. And, you know, that's why I work so hard on things like education. And that's why I always say job creation is job one. And I mean, it's about creating opportunities so people can really pursue their dreams. Well, that appeals to everybody, regardless of race, creed, or color. I mean, that is what, what America is all about. I think that's been the success of North Dakota, uh, you know, over the last decade plus, is that we've really emphasized that ability to build your life, build your career, build your small business, and, and really live life uh, the way you want. And, um, you know, I think that's something that, that appeals to all people. And that's what I believe is the fundamental message of the Republican Party. And, and I think we've got to connect on that, and then we've got to listen. And we've got to make sure that we're understanding what people want and need and that we're solving the big problems of the day, whether it's the deficit, whether it's preserving our entitlement programs, whether it's um, illegal immigration or uh, the need to, to produce more energy with good environmental stewardship, all these things. We've got to be problem solvers. That's what people expect uh, from their government. Okay. Who do you see as some of the future national leaders of your party? All the ones that you know you would uh, likely uh, think about. For example, John Thune, 
uh, was in here today because I was taking pictures of him in a bison jersey because he lost the bet on the North Dakota State, South Dakota State game. And boy, was that fun. And I put him right under that big bison that we have in the other room. And he's, he's fabulous. Uh, there's one example. Yesterday, Rob Portman, one of my closest friends in the Senate, was in here. Rob's from Ohio. He and I work on a lot of things together and we're very close. Uh, absolutely one of the most capable, most intelligent people that, that I've ever worked with. I think both of them. Uh, Marco Rubio, I mean, really is charismatic, and he's not just charismatic uh, on camera. When you meet him one-on-one, -on -one, tremendous uh, strength of personality, but a good guy. I mean, he's the kind of guy that, you know, you can just kind of talk with and have fun with, and he's down to earth, and, he, and, he, and he's modest. I think, uh, you know, there's three, and, and I can go on with a lot more if you want, but I, I think we've got a, a lot of young people uh, that are very talented, and I look at not just their ability uh, to, you know, um, generate support and and have a, a have a strong persona, but are they, you know, they, they're are they a good person? Do you like being around them? Do they do they have an ego problem? Those kind of things. I mean, and what I'm seeing is we've got a lot of great folks. Senator, you had a reputation as governor to get things done in a bipartisan way. Now in Washington and with things, the political climate that we've got, do you see yourself being able to work in, in a bipartisan way moving forward? Definitely. I mean, I, I am a strong you believer speak. in working in a bipartisan way. I think that's how you get things done. In the Senate, you need 60 votes. That's where I come from. And, and I, we need folks here that are willing to kind of reach across, both Republicans and Democrats. That's what it's going to take to get things done, and I'm definitely committed to it. Okay. Talk about what's the hardest part of your job uh, here as a U.S. Senator. One of the, you know, it, it, when you say the hardest, that's always a little tough, but one of the hardest is you have zero control over your schedule. You know, I was a governor for 10 years where we said, okay, this is what we're going to try and do, and this is how we're going to go at it, and we'd slot our time, and we'd go at it. And any time we started to get off on something else, I'd bring us back to it. And, and you know, people that know me know I'm pretty determined when, when I say this is what we got to be working on. And uh, here, I mean, gee, the minute you set something up, then they change it. There's a floor vote or a committee meeting or a caucus meeting. And it's not just like it happens once in a while. It happens every day, all day long. So you invariably have kind of three things scheduled at once, and then you can lay in these good plans to really go after something, and then they'll change the schedule on you six times. So that's one of the things you got to kind of get your mind around and learn how to work in that kind of chaotic, free-flowing environment. And then the other part of it is, and, and, and this is something I see as a challenge and important to get, important to getting things done, is you got to figure out how you're going to work with people to, you know, build the kind of coalitions and majority that it takes to, to actually get something done. And, and I think about that every day, getting something done. Well, with that then, I, what's the best part of your job? When you actually, you know, um, get something done for the, for the people of your state, uh, or we get something done that, that really matters for the country. The reason that I ran for the Senate um, two years into my third term as governor is I, I really believe North Dakota was, was, was doing well. Great people, great state doing a great job. And I couldn't be more proud of, of our state and our people. And I can't tell you how much I hear about North Dakota and what's going on there uh, around the country. It, it, it's, it's really amazing. But our country, we've got some real challenges to solve, and, and I want to be part of, of solving them. And so that, that's what I look forward to. Is, I mean, that doesn't mean it, it's not fun every day. It, frankly, a lot of it's pretty hard work. But I want to be part of getting us on track. And uh, this is a great country, the greatest in the world. We've got some challenges we've got to solve. I believe that it's eminently doable, and I want to be part of, of uh, the solution. Well, I, I will ask you this right here for, for Pulse. Uh, Senator Conrad's retiring uh, as governor. You worked with Senator Conrad for many years, now as senator for the last uh, couple of years. Uh, any comments about Senator Conrad as he's bowing out now? Of course, wish him the best in whatever his future endeavors are. But, you know, I really have enjoyed working with him over my first two years in the Senate. And I, I give him a lot of credit. You know, he, he, was a, he is the senior senator since the, since. The first time I came down here, he reached out to me. We have worked together very well, very well. 
And uh, so I, I just want to express my appreciation to him for that and, uh, you know, just wish him the very best. Senator, if people want more information from you or your office, where's the best place for them to go? Well, they can always call us. The easiest way probably is to go to our, our website, which is uh, hoven.senate.gov. Uh, That's the easiest, but obviously I have offices in, in Bismarck, Fargo, Minot, and um, Grand Forks, and of course now in Williston. So they can call us, um, but maybe the easiest is to just go to the website. Senator, thanks for allowing us to be here today. Good to have you. Well, that's all we have on Prairie Pulse this week. And as always, thanks for watching.